Okay, so today we are going to discuss uh, uh, the cavity approach. To the, uh, to the perceptron. So what we are going to discuss uh, has uh, many different names. So in, uh, in the context of computer science, it's called belief propagation. So this is uh, computer science mainly. Uh, but it's called also beta approximation uh, in physics. And uh, in particular, in, in the context of uh, disordered systems, uh, has the name of cavity method. which is kind of uh, average version of the belief propagation algorithm. So this is typically seen as an algorithm. And we will see that uh, it's, it, it is, uh, it, it's really a, a, an algorithm. OK. So what, what we are going to do is to uh, start from uh, the belief, belief propagation equations and then try to simplify them uh, uh, step by step. And in the end, we will get uh, uh, the TAP equation. So TAP stands for Tables Anderson Palmer. Uh, from which we will get uh, back the replica symmetric uh, equations. So the plan is first uh, discuss belief propagation, then we will. Uh, Let's say, let's say simplify these equations in order to get the top equations uh, that we will discuss. And then we will see that these equations match the replica symmetric uh, solution that we have discussed uh, in, the, in the former lectures. OK, so let's start from uh, beef propagation. OK, so let's consider a model that is, that is defined on a tree. So let's forget for the moment the perceptron and consider a general model that is defined on a tree. So you have variables that are on a tree. OK. Uh, and that, uh, let's assume that the, the partition function can be written as uh, the integral over all the n variables. OK, so let's, let's write like this. Uh, that live on some space, in some space. Uh, and here we have uh, a term that is an site, uh, let's say, kind of magnetic field. So we call this, this Fs of xi. So this is a, a local term. OK. And then we have the product over all the nearest neighbors uh, variables times a link term. OK. OK. So now uh, let's consider the following. So suppose that. Uh, uh, so what we would like to do is to compute the marginals, OK? So we would like to, to compute, uh, OK, let me call this, this mu i of x i. So this is the marginal of, of, of the variable uh, x i. So it's what you get if you integrate out all the other variables except from i, OK? So, in part so it's just the. Uh, OK, let me write this. What, is, what this is? This is one word z. And then you integrate over uh, j different than i 
this thing, okay? The same thing. Okay? So we would like to understand how to compute these objects. So the way in which you can do it is, uh, is basically a, an implementation of the transfer matrix method that you know in one-dimensional systems. So what you do is the following. So you consider, for example, the variable i, and then you assume that you remove this interaction. Okay? So if you remove this interaction, what happens is that this part of the tree becomes disconnected from this one. Okay? So let, let me call mu i to j of xi. This is the marginal of the variable xi when I have removed this link. Okay? And now we would like to write an equation for, this, for these objects. Okay? And the equation is, 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 is very simple because I, I will write it and then I will comment it. So mu i to j, this is a normalization factor, OK? And then it's the product of a k. I will write, and then I will tell you what is the notation. So this is the product over all sides k that are connected to i, OK? So for example, this two, but without the site j, OK? So I have removed this link. Then I consider this site and the neighbors, OK? And then I consider what, what are the marginals without these links. So these are mu k to i xk. So it's the marginals of these variables when these links are removed. OK. And these are these objects. Times, sorry, here there is a factor that I forget. And I will tell you. Times this function. OK. So what is, why, what is the meaning of this equation? So, so this term here. This is just the probability distribution of this, the, the variable i when you have removed everything. Okay? It's just an on-site probability without the normalization factor, of course. Okay? But you can interpret this term as the probability of the variable i to be xi when everything is, has been removed. And this is just the probability, apart from the normalization factor, of the variable i to be equal to xi when you have fixed the variable k. So this is just the composition of probabilities. Is, is it clear? It's is it clear? This is a, a normalization constant. So you, you just compute it by normalizing this, this formula. You just wrote conditional probability, but you pushed the problem away by one step. Yes, yes, okay. yes. But in doing this, what you see is that suppose that you have a, a big tree, then this gives you an algorithm to compute the marginals in the bulk. Because what you do is that you start from the leaves of the tree, and then you iterate this equation. Okay. As, for example, in the, in the transfer matrix method, when you have a chain, you start from the border, and then you iterate uh, the transfer matrix and you get the, the partition function, OK? So this is for a, for a model defined in this way. And now let me consider a, a, a slightly more complicated situation in which we have a factor graph. OK, so so here you have a factor graph, but you can put the interaction like that, right? For each link, 
you have just an interaction that contains two variables. Okay. Now what I would like to do is to to consider this topology in which we have many variables that enter <coughs> in the same interaction. <coughs> okay. Okay. So in this case, the partition function, you, you can write it this way, right? So, uh, again, you have an on-site term in general. And then here you have the product over all the interactions. Let's say that you have m of them. And then here, here I put some function fc, c stands for check. This, these are called check nodes. Uh, and it's a, it's a function of all the variables. So let me call this in principle mu. So x mu is just the, the set of variables that enter in the constraint mu. OK, if I call this constraint, this interaction term mu, then x mu is just a set of variables that enter in, the, in, this, uh, in this interaction. OK. And now we can write an equation that is the same spirit of this one, just by using uh, uh, the same argument. So. So let me consider a site i, and this is mu. Uh, then what I can do is that I can remove this, uh, this link, this in, uh, the fact that this variable enters into this interaction, and therefore the, the graph becomes disconnected. So I can consider this marginal, mu r. Sorry, maybe I can call this, let me call this a. OK, and now we call, OK, let me call this A. So mu i to A of x i. So what is this? This is a normalization factor. Here you have the onset uh, probability. OK, and then what do I have? Well, I have a product over all the nearest uh, interactions without this one that I removed. No? So this is the product over, let, let me call B, that are nearest neighbor of I without A. OK. And then I have the product, so the, the integral over these variables here that enter into these nodes without this one. So I have the product of, uh, let me just say, uh, k, k that are around these nodes that are b without i, without this one. Then I have mu of k to b, xk, and then I have fb Is it okay? It's exactly the same, <coughs> the same as here. So we consider the marginals here without these links. OK. And then we obtain the, uh, we just repeated exactly what we have done, but for each branch here. Is it clear? <laughs> uh, 
So this equation can be rewritten in a more simple way. Uh, it's just uh, something that is useful, but not very. So what you can do is that you can call this uh, mu b to k x k. And so you have two coupled equations. You have mu i to a. So this is a normalization factor. So you have fs, exactly this term. So now let me put a hat here, just to. So you see that this depends, this term depends only on i, xi. Sorry. Uh, <coughs> right? Because you integrate over all the variables here except this one. OK? And then you have the other one, that is mu b to i. And this is. So again, uh, you, can, you, you can imagine that you have uh, a big tree, and then you start from the leaves of the tree, and then you iterate these two equations. And then you get the cavity marginals. These are called cavity marginals, because are the marginals without one link. Okay. And then, so you start from the leaves, and then you iterate in the bulk, mm. and you get all the all these probability distributions. And then once you have them, you can compute the real marginals. Okay. So let's consider, for example, this site. Okay. Let me. So in order to compute the real marginal, so let us look at this equation. So this equation is when you have removed this link, right? And now you want it to add it again. And so the real marginal is just given by, oh sorry. It's a normalization factor, of course. You have the onside term. And here, the product just run over all the neighbors, interaction neighbors of i. <coughs> OK? So you see that if you have the solutions for the cavity marginals, then you can compute the real marginal. Yes. Um, I arrived late. W what is f here? F? Know what is f? Ah, so, uh, so this is, you can write down the, 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 the partition function mm -hmm. as a term that acts on single sides. And then you have terms that are coupling all the, coupling a set of variables. So this is a kind of magnetic field term. 
So if you have, for example, the easing model, this is just it's just e to the h i that is a local field on the side i x i. I will show you what is this in the case of the perceptron. Okay, it's just notation. So you can write down the, the partition function this way. This is a general way to write it. Okay. okay. Is it? Okay. I, will, I will give you the, the example okay, no, of the perceptron okay. now. Okay, okay. I like splitting the, uh, the, the yes. minus p the h. The yes, exactly. Uh, exactly. Okay. Exactly. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So. So let's consider the, the perceptron. <coughs> okay. So let, let's consider the spherical perceptron. OK, so we, we write the partition function this way. So, okay. so we have the, so this is the integral over uh, a vector x, that is x1, xn, and uh, the sum over i from 1 to n of xi squared is equal to n. So this is a spherical constraint. And then here we have e to the <coughs> minus beta sum over all the constraints mu from 1 to m of v of h mu. And h mu OK. So let me call this w mu i, so the, the, the elements of this vector, <coughs> so this vector, I will call it w mu, OK? This, again, are random variables. The components of this vector are random variables, Gaussian random variables with zero mean and unit variance, OK? And now, you see, we would like to, to write something uh, of the form uh, this form. And you see that here, <coughs> if we take the model as it, as it is, we cannot do that. Because when we derive these equations, we have assumed that when we remove a link, the variables can be integrated uh, independently. Instead, here, you see that you have a spherical constraint that couples all the variables. And therefore, we need to do something more, because otherwise, we cannot redo the, the same constructions here. So what we do? is that we, in, we include the Lagrange multiplier. To enforce the spherical constraint. So we just say, OK, so apart from, OK, let me write it. So now here, the, the integration is free. You don't have the spherical constraint. But then here, you put a term. So, OK. <coughs> term is a constant <coughs> we can completely neglect. It's a, a constant. Uh, OK. <coughs> and so you see that we have exactly this form. So we have, apart from a constant, it's the integral over the x Oops.
Okay, so this lambda will be fixed uh, by imposing that this relation is satisfied. Okay? So we have something of this form, but you see that here, okay, let me write the factor graph of this model. Okay, so we have done already. Let me recall it. So we have the variables, and then we have the constraints, these interactions. And since we have decoupled the, the, the spherical constraint, each variable is connected to a kind of, OK. No, let, let, let me write this way. So on each variable, there is an, an on-site term that is of this form, that is exactly this. Is it clear? OK. And then each variable is connected to all constraints. So since each variable is connected to all constraints, this is not a trick, definitely, right? But it turns out that these equations, which are which can be proven by constructions by construction on a tree, they hold in two remarkable in two remarkable cases. So the first one is that they hold on graphs that are locally tree-like. <coughs> For example, we discussed uh, uh, random regular graphs or Erdos-Reni random graphs. And you can show that these random graphs are locally tree-like in the sense that if you, if you take the thermodynamic limit, the loops uh, have length that scales logarithmic with the system size. So if you look at the bulk of, the, of these graphs, the bulk is as it, 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 if it were a tree. Okay? And in this case, you can show that you can apply uh, this belief propagation equations. Okay. The other case is fully connected models. Okay. So the main reason for that, so, okay, there is an argument uh, I will tell you that is the following. So, let me consider uh, uh, removing a link here. Okay. If I remove the, this link, what I'm subtracting uh, to the system is just a term of this, of this order. So suppose that this variable is i. I'm just neglecting a term of this kind. Okay. But this term is of order 1 over square root of n. So it's very small. Okay. And therefore, therefore you can try to treat it in perturbation theory. It's a very small perturbation that you have done to the to the system. Okay. And in the end, this means that actually when you look to this problem, the only thing that matters are just the magnetizations. Okay, you don't have correlation because, co because correlations are subleading in M. Okay, it's a fully connected model. Is, is, is that okay? And actually, the, the first version of this belief propagation equation was, was obtained really in this way. So you started from the, the model that is fully connected, then you remove just one variable, which means that you are removing terms that are awarded one of square root of M. And you treat this term in perturbation theory. Okay. So what we will do now is to take this equation, the belief propagation equations, and apply them to this factor graph. Okay. Okay, so 
Let me rewrite these two equations. Now I will use, I will call mu m, sorry for the change of connotation, but it's, it's better, because now I will use mu to denote the, the interactions. So this is the cavity marginal of the site i. When I remove the factor node mu, so this is, apart from the normalization, I will completely forget the normalizations that are not important for what I will tell you. So you, you remove a constraint or a link between one variable and one I remove, here I remove uh, the constraint. So I say, what is the probability distribution of the variable i when I removed the interaction mu in which it enters? Only for i, but Only it's for still I. there for the others. For the others, it's still there, OK? So this is, we have the on-site term, which is OK. And then we have the product over all the, con the, 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 the constraints, interactions, that are around i without mu. <coughs> Let me call this m tilde because it goes from a constraint to a variable, right? OK, this is the first equation, OK, that one. And now let me write this one. So this is m tilde of mu to i xi. <coughs> this is, again, I, I neglect the normalization constant. use the fact that we have a fully connected model. So actually, this becomes new, that is different from new, right? And this is k that is different from i. OK, so what, what you can show, and I will not do it, but so what happens when you have these fully connected models and the interactions that are very, very weak is that you can close these equations on Gaussians. So what we, we assume, so you can see it as a closure scheme or an approximation scheme. We can assume that m k to nu It's a Gaussian. So it's E, apart from the normalization, you have a variance here, and that's k minus, and this is the average, k, k, 2. OK. So we parameterize this probability distribution with two variables, v and a. OK. And now the game is that we take this equation, we plug it here, and then we, we would like to have a recursion equation for these variables. OK? Uh, so the two um, variables actually, the mi given you is marginal if you had removed the link to the mm -hmm. Is there an interpretation of the second one as well? Until yeah, the other interpretation is that, so this, so you have, the, the, the interaction of new, and then you have a set of variables here, and here you have i. So this is like if the, this is like the probability of the variable i to be equal to xi when you when it fills only this this interaction. Uh, okay. have other constraints, but but here in principle you have the others, right? Okay. You get all of them except it, it's what this interaction is telling to this variable. It's kind of local field that this interaction is pushing on this variable. Okay. It's the it's the contribution of this part of the graph on the probability of this variable. Okay. 
אוקיי? אוקיי. אוקיי, אז of course when you plug this into this equation you can perform the Gaussian integrals okay so I will not do it because it's, uh, it's a Gaussian integral and what you can show is that when you plug this into this equation this until it's a Gaussian again So M tilde this is E to the minus A nu to I over 2 x I squared plus B nu to I x I okay So I, I, I forgot to tell you a reference. So this way of doing the, uh, this thing can be found in a, in a review paper by Zaka and Mr. Bono. And it's called uh, Statistical Physics of Inference. I think that we already said this. Okay, so, so, so you have two parameters, again, that are connected, of course, to this one. And let me tell you what is the connection. So, I mean, this is just, I will not do the details, but you just plug the reduction there, and then you have the A nu to I is minus W u i squared and I will tell you what these variables are So these variables are So you have A and B, then you can compute this, this, this sums, okay? And then you get these two variables. And this function R, so R and B, this is just one over B. So this sigma is the sigma that enters into the definition of the model, right? It's the, so remember that we have h mu. Okay, so this sigma is, is, that, is exactly the parameter of the model. And here you have z minus omega. And then here you have a normalization, so you send this z minus omega to one. Okay. Okay. So 
I will not, I, I, don't, I don't do the details, but it's, uh, it's very simple to, to get this solution, just plug the Gaussians. Okay. So now we have, we started from, we started from the Gaussian answers for this. We obtained this M tilde, okay, that is given in terms of these two parameters that you can compute, <coughs> you have the equations to compute them. Okay, and now we, we have to close the equations. So we take what we have here and we plug it there, and then we will get again this probability distribution. Okay, and then we have to arrange everything in such a way that it's self consistent. Okay, so let me do it. The Gaussian assumption, yeah. because you can show that actually when you have a fully connected model, due to the fact that you have weak interactions, mm -hmm. you, you yeah, get no. uh, a Gaussian. Okay. You can even show it uh, on in the equations, since you have the Ws that are of the order one with square root of n. Okay. Okay. But is it, for instance, at least morally similar reason? Like, for instance, if you have, I don't know, sum of independent random yes. variables. And so yeah. Gaussian law is a stable law. Yes, yes. Uh, uh, so, but in that case, you have to sum many of them. With one, you would never get Gaussian. Yeah, exactly. But in this case, you have many of them. Because each term there, it's the sum of n terms, and then it's large. So you can think that a Gaussian is good. Which is good if you have, uh, OK, so there are, I mean, I will not discuss what happens when you have replica symmetry breaking. But in the case where you have replica symmetry, this is okay. And okay, okay maybe side that's another question. So, okay, Gaussian by far the most important stable law, mm -hmm. but there are also the Levy and there are other things mm -hmm. uh, when you know some moments diverge. Do you something like no. that never mm -hmm. happened here? No, this is here the variance and the average is fine. Okay. 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 So, okay. Let, uh, So we take the other equation I will write it. Sorry. <coughs> so then we plug that form here. And so we have can be written as sorry this is just uh, now here I introduce sigma hat so I to me and this sigma hat and t are just uh, so sigma i to mu is just uh, some So we started from the A and V, then we obtain the omega and big V, 
then we get we got a big a and big b okay and now we have these two variables okay now so we have so we have m of i to mu that's i and now remember that this this is a, 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 a we assume that it was a Gaussian, so it's to V uh, I to mu and so let's compute the variance and the average of X I using this and this will give us a closing equation for the A and B okay example if you consider a i to mu this is what this is just the integer for x i x i and um, so in principle there is no normal there is not any normalization factor but <coughs> since we are not using the normalization factor here let me write it so here I have to put m, that is this, so it's so it's uh, this form. just the normalization factor, okay? I just use this expression to evaluate the average of xi that is, that is this, right, by definition. And let's say you can do exactly the same for v by computing okay? So when you do this, then you get this equation. Let me call this function f a. function so this is just uh, basically this function here so it's uh, it depends on lambda the Lagrange multiplier that we use to fix the spherical constraints but sigma and then you have just the normalization. Okay? So, so we started from A and V. Small a and small v. Okay. So let's let's as assume that we do we solve this equation in the following way. We throw in some way the initial values of A and V. Okay. Then we compute omega and big V. Okay. 
at the next step. Then we compute the A, big A and big B using this expression. Then having this, uh, we compute T and hat sigma. Okay. And then once we have this, we can compute this function F and get back a new guess for A and B. So you see that this is an iterative algorithm. Okay. And if you are in the replica symmetric phase, this converges to a unique fixed point. Okay. At fixed uh, At fixed disorder. So this is a, a, an algorithm that is on a single instance of the problem because you have, you see that here you have the Ws that appear everywhere. So this means that you have a single instance of the problem, you run it, and then you get the marginals and the, so the, the averages and variances for a single instance. Okay. So it's powerful because it allows you to solve problems that are defined on a single instance. Because otherwise, if you want to have something that is average, then you just do the, the replica method. Okay. Then we will see that this is, we get back the same uh, replica uh, symmetric result when, once we, <coughs> OK? So this, this algorithm is called uh, uh, the relaxed. So this is relaxed. Belief propagation. <coughs> so it's it's relaxed because we have relaxed everything on Gaussians. Okay. But you see that. So let me just. Uh, okay. Before I uh, simplify these equations. So now. We have the, 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 the cavity marginals that are expressed in terms of A and B. Once you have converged to the fixed point, then you have the A and Vs, and then you have the cavity marginals, right? And now what we would like to do is to compute the real marginals. So what are the magnetizations of the variables? So again, this we can do. OK, I think that here I have everything. Uh, ah, no. This work, I need to also this too. Uh, what do I do? Uh, okay, I use this as part. So, if you want to compute the real average, so the, the real magnetization, okay, you can show that this is exactly the same thing here. But here, instead of putting this, just put sigma i and t i. And for the variance, it's the same. So if you compute x i, let me call this a i and this v i. And this sigma i and ti are given by the same expression here, but when I include also the, the, the mu constraint. Okay. So this is just sum over mu. just look at how many variables we have. So the leading order, so we would like to understand what is the, the order in n. Okay. So you see that you have each, so you have a variable for each connection between a constraint and a variable node, right? So in general, this algorithm contains n, the order of n squared variables. Right? 
And now what we would like to do is to reduce the complexity to order n variables. So how do we do that? Huh? Yes. What we did is that for you, you input A and B for the site that I mean, Yes. but also for all the other Yes. Sites. And when you do an iteration, yes. all of the A and B of yes. all the sites are yes. updated. Yes. Now, I, I don't want to discuss and how And then you get the cavity it. marginals of everybody on just one site. Mm -hmm. No, it's supposed to. No. Of course, the cavity marginals. Just so this is the cavity marginals for all the sites. Okay, so for each site, you have the cavity marginals. Yes, of all the possible exclusions, yes. Okay. All the possible exclusions. Then uh, what you want to compute is the, the real uh, yes, okay. magnetization <coughs> covariances. Okay. okay, so how do we, we do that? Uh, okay, so what do I do? Okay, this part I don't need. No? So let me consider this equation. So we have omega nu to i write new somewhere uh, at some point because okay. okay now I can write this as I mean this is a clear thing I can sum over all the terms okay And then I can subtract the term that I'm adding, that is the, the term on i. Sorry, I, I'm doing. Now, this term is of order 1 with square root of n, right? Because these things are of the order 1 with square root of n. Okay? And so the idea is to treat this term in perturbation theory in these equations. Okay. So we expand around this thing and we include this term as a perturbation. So we define this as omega nu. And then the idea is that we rewrite everything in terms of this single uh, constraint of site variables. Is that clear? By treating these terms in perturbation theory. Maybe it's better if we make a break now. And then we start that. Hello. Um, okay, so so what we get uh, from uh, this algorithm that we have described to the one that we will describe. Uh, so the one that we will describe is is actually the Taul are actually Taules Anderson Palmer equations that were derived in nineteen seventy six. Uh, for uh, the sharing concrete public model. Uh, so let me just tell you other references. So uh, there is Nezar that did these equations for this model. Uh, okay, a uh, slightly different version of this model, but it's in the end uh, similar. <coughs> Nezar. And it's. Uh, okay, there are two papers. So there is one that is very recent, 
and one is older. So the older one is JPC. Uh, so it's 22. And it's uh, 1989. And it's, this is with like the old cavity map, mm. old meaning that uh, you don't have the algorithmic uh, interpretation, but the way in which you derive it is really extracting one, uh, one variable from the, the factor graph and treating the, this operation in perturbation theory. And the more recent one, one where uh, you can do and develop all this formalism is uh, PRE. Uh, of this year, 95.02.217. Okay, and then for this problem, there is also other paper. <coughs> but they, they derived these equations in a different way uh, using the large n expansion. So this is a model that is fully connected. Then you can do a large n expansion for the, the free energy defined in terms of local magnetizations, and in the end you get the same equations. Uh, so this is uh, what? This is just that. Uh, so it's 2016-093301. Okay. Okay, so so let's go back to the equations. So can I just way back question? So for instance, typically if we want to do something, optimize something on some constraint, we do add this uh, Lagrange multiplier. Mm -hmm. But the way you add it, you just put into exponent uh, e minus lambda mm -hmm. x i yes. squared minus n, yes. and I just do not see where you even. Uh, do this variational calculus where you put it uh, in ah, exponent, in exponent, and <coughs> just well. And in the end, what I will do is that I mean, I, will, I don't put an arc constraint. Okay. Yes, you don't. Well, what I'm doing is that then I finally I select this Lagrange multiplier lambda in such a way that this thing <coughs> is one. So I compute the cavity marginals, the probability distributions of the variable i. And then I compute this, and I enforce this to 1. And this gives me an equation for lambda. Mm -hmm. That's how I fix it. OK. Mm -hmm. But why you put it in exponent? This uh, you, you can write exponent minus, I don't know, sum of x i squared, uh, xi squared minus m squared, or some other function. So, so it's a Gaussian regularizer that I fix in, in such a way that an average Just technically convenient? Or? Yes. I mean, it's a okay. but otherwise, you can see it as a, I mean, in principle, you can write a delta function of this. Then yes, yes, the yes. Uh, so that would be uh, true, uh, truly, truly, yes. That's yes. Right. But I mean, I, I, okay, it's, it's the same thing. Okay. Then you. Okay, okay so. Let me start from this. Uh, okay, so we have this equal to omega mu minus w mu i a i to mu. Okay. Okay, and now, okay, can I, what can I do? So let me write. Uh, Let me write here these two <coughs> questions. So sigma hot I do not. Erase everything. No. 
So we start from omega Okay, let me consider this. Okay, so we have so we have the derivative with respect to the omega variable. So, so this is already of order 1 over n, okay? And therefore this term that is of order 1 over square root, square root of n will give me a subleading order in the sense that it will be a term of order 1 over n to the power 3 alpha, <coughs> okay? And I will neglect completely this, these terms, okay? I will keep only terms that are of order 1 over n, or n especially one terms of order 1 over square root of n. Okay, so this term is just minus, I will approximate it Okay, so uh, sorry I forgot to tell you one thing Okay, so we have this omega mu and let's, let's consider also this equation Now, if I add or, 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 or uh, so, okay, let me write this. <coughs> and this is minus. So this term is over there, one over n. But this term is of order 1. So this term is completely negligible with respect to this one. And therefore, I will forget this. And so this is u, v, uh, nu. OK. So when I plug these two here, since this is already of the order of 1 over uh, n, you get this, right? There is no correction. And then if, if I consider B, so this was, this is this, okay? Now this is, is like V, v but then this gets a correction, okay? That is this term, that gives me a term that is over the one over n. So when you, comp you just get mu i, r, minus <coughs> okay now let me consider AI that is the variable the average of XI this is the true average not the cavity one it's what we would like to compute. Okay. So let me consider this one and vi, that is uh, xi minus ai squared i. So this, again, I rewrite the, the, the expression that I wrote before. This is fa. Now this <coughs> sigma hat and ti are like this one, but where you sum over all variables. Okay. Okay, let me compute them. So you have sigma high 
this is the sum of the new and then this can be approximated at leading order as minus so just using this And then Ti, Oops. it's uh, okay, so we have sigma half high, and then we just plug this equation into the expression for B. So this is. Uh, uh, We just plug this. Okay, let me write it this way. But we just plug this here and the sum. Okay, there is a sum over here. Okay. Okay. Now. <coughs> now let me consider. A I to me. So this has exactly the same expression as here, except for the fact that here I have to put sigma hat I to mu and ti I to mu. It's this one. Very simple. <coughs> okay. So I have A. So here sigma is just given by this. So, okay. So and okay. Okay. So this is just Then I expand in this term. So this is and okay, so this is this is just a I. And then I have minus, let me call VI, that, I will, uh, that is this one. Okay. It's just given by this. So this is BI <coughs> times W mu I R B. Okay. And then V. Ah, in this is a leading border. It's easy to show. Just be high. Okay. So now we have this expressed in terms of AI and VI, and this is the same. Okay. Now let let's. Okay. Let okay. Let me do. It. Okay, now, now we have basically to close the equations, right? Because we started from these two and we, we consider the perturbations, okay? <coughs> and now we want to close them, okay? Because we want to obtain the equation for omega mu and we, v nu. Okay, so what do I write? Okay, can I write uh, like somewhere there? <coughs> okay, let me 
right here. So let me consider omega mu. This is just the sum over k. And now we plug uh, this expression here. Okay. So this is minus And then for v nu, v nu, we have just uh, <coughs> yes. v. okay. So let me rewrite the equations, so, okay, so, so yeah, we have these two equations, okay, so starting from AK and VK, we can get omega mu and v, big V mu, okay, and then we have sigma i, that is uh, here, that is given in terms of omega mu and V mu, Okay, and ti, that is somewhere here, and I will rewrite. So we get from a and v, we get omega and big v, from which we get sigma and t. Okay. And then we plug this sigma and t into the definition of ai and vi, and we close the equations. Let me rewrite them. So we have this two, then we have sigma i is minus okay. And then finally we have a i that is this function f a and v i okay so you start with a guess of A and V, then you get omega and big V. Okay, they just depend on okay, on A and V. Sorry, uh, you see something. Yes. So you, okay. So you start with a guess of all the variables. Okay. Then you ob obtain a new omega and V, right? Then you get you obtain 
this sigma and t, and then you close. Okay. Okay. So sorry. This this thing. Let me rewrite it. Yeah. Of course, this can be simplified, right? Because this is just the So this is. We can we can do a, 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 a another simplification that is the following. So when we take the large n limit, we can think that this variable is actually one over n, right? Because it fluctuates, but with fluctuations that are sublimit. So, so let me do. So what we can say is that this thing goes to 1 over n. And therefore, this is a constant. So this is a constant to this. OK. So you reduce, L, so here in principle you had m variables, and here you get one. Okay. Then this just becomes okay. Then this one, just this term, becomes AI divided by M. Right? And that's it. So this term, the last term here, And there is this, uh, this term here. This goes to sigma. All these things become equal, right? Because this is 1 over n, and then you have a sum over u of something that does not depend on i. So all the sigma, sigmas are equal. And then you have minus ah. Here you have n variables and you have just one. So this therefore is a constant. Okay. And finally this one, remember that V <coughs> was 1 over n sum over k dk. We can take a sum over i of both sides of this equation, and then we have V that is sigma over m Yes, because I just said that these things, when you sum over k by central limit theorem, they don't, they don't fluctuate, and this is one over Okay, and you leave the sign. You, you leave, uh, uh, this is square. Yeah, but the w 
the W is there. Minus oscillating. No, no, the, the W is still there. I just approximate the square of ah. the W with 1 over n. Ah, okay. So you still have W here. And just say that the square, this is a, a, a positive uh, number, and it's converging to 1 over n. And also kind of, <laughs> even if the step really back, so for instance, you have this, you know, bipartite uh, graph, mm -hmm. you know, those are i's and those are mm -hmm. mu's. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, for instance, when it's written like i label, one I almost thinks about somehow some chain, but it's not here no. because, bec because here essentially space is a, there's no space. Yes. And the only way where there is dependence on this index is because this is, you know, there is some randomness. Yes. Uh, and, and actually it was just bothering me that it seems like uh, still, you know, maybe doesn't depend. At least here I see now some things starts not being dependent on mu. But this depends. At this, yeah. And, and AI, so even without you are showing us, you know, would it depend on I? The Yes, the AI depends on us. So still you have fluctuations from side to side of demagnetization. Yeah, but it's okay. But, but, but the variance no. I mean uh, the variance is fixed. I see. So so but in a way it's written depends on I, but it's in a way just uh, uh, not really I but it's a sort of random variable, this AI. I yes, the random variable is a Gaussian random variable. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. With so a but you I still mean, can't ignore that it's uh, you can't replace it by average value or something. So the, the AI are not random variable. The the AI are magnetization. So yeah, you can yeah, hear yeah. that on each spin the variable is a Gaussian random variable with yeah. an average that is this one and a variance that is constant. Yeah, but I can other. think about them as you know, as yes, each one of course is not random. Yes. yes. But overall they form a yes. set. Yeah, exactly. set as I exactly. Yeah. Okay. But could you envision a lot, some of those things from almost the uh, beginning and not, you know, bothering yourself with writing so many indices? Ah, yes, yes. You can do it, and this is uh, the, the, the old paper that was cited by uh, Mark Nazar. I see. So okay. what you can do is that, so. Okay, I can give you an in. Okay, so let me write. So basically, what you can do is starting from the beginning. Mm -hmm. So you have an equation for each side, right? So you have uh, the belief propagation equation that run on the full system. Mm -hmm. Now, suppose that you take the large n limit mm -hmm. and you look at the bulk, mm -hmm. which where the bulk means when you have converged all the the messages. Mm -hmm. Now you can think that, suppose that you start from a tree. Now, OK, let me consider a tree, a very big tree, not a fully connected model. But let's consider a very big tree. You start from the leaves, and then you iterate up to the bulk. And you hope that when you are in the bulk, the, ita the iteration is converged to something. OK, so on average, you expect that since you have taken a large, side, l large uh, system, just by iterating from the leaves and doing many, many iterations, you have converged to a cavity marginal that is actually the same as you would do averaging over the disorder. Okay, so you have a fixed point. <coughs> and then from this fixed point, you have an equation for the, the average over i of this, this thing and the variance. Okay. So this is, uh, for example, what you do when you do Anderson localization. This is the same. You start from on the beta lattice. You start from the leaves, and then you convert. You go in the bulk. In the bulk, <coughs> the iteration is converged to something, and then this fixed point equation it becomes a fixed point equation because on the right hand side and left hand side of the equation you have exactly the same thing. Mm -hmm. Then there you have the it, it's it's a fixed point equation. Okay. It doesn't depend on the thing. So this is the way in which you can avoid all these things. But I mean. What, what I would like to stress is that these indices are interesting in the sense that this, is, this can be treated as an algorithm. Mm -hmm. So suppose that you have a problem where you want to compute the, the magnetizations. Mm -hmm. So typical problem are uh, inference problems. Mm -hmm. So where you would like to estimate some signal, where the estimation of signal is just giving the magnetizations of each component of the signal. Mm -hmm. In this case, having the eyes, the indices, is really useful because it it tells you a way to compute them. It's, and you see that this is, uh, I mean, this is like, uh, you have just to do some multiplications, matrix multiplications, and some computation of a function. 
and it's very efficient. So, okay. So, <coughs> so I forgot to mention that up to we up to the point where we started to do this approximation, the algorithm that you have is called uh, uh, generalized AMP. Well, AMP stands for approximate message passing. So you can, so messages are just these variables. So the variables that I call A, B, they are also called messages because it's what a part of the graph is telling to the other part. Okay, it's kind of they are communicating some <coughs> beliefs, some probability beliefs. That, that this is also why these these things are called with belief propagation, okay? Uh, and it's, it's uh, okay, it's generalized just because, okay, you put the lines. Okay, so approximate message passing, uh, this is something that was started, uh, okay, I don't have the references, but Montanari Tal. In the context of compress sensing, Okay, which is a problem that is very close to the perception that we have treated, but I will not enter into the details of the problem. And now it's it's really applied to many, many problems. So um, those of you who work with length I know uh, a lot of things on this. Uh, and and the the version in which I replaced these variables with one over n. It's called AMP, okay, only. And actually, you can show that these equations, the equations that we got, are exactly the Taurus Anderson Palmer equations. So the nice thing about AMP is that I, I have not shown you here, but it, it tells you, I mean, it's more than uh, uh, the Taurus Anderson Palmer equation, because in the Taurus Anderson Palmer equation, you have just fixed point equations, okay? Here you have fixed point equations, but the, the way in which we, we have derived them, it's, it's, it has an algorithmic value in the sense that, for example, you can tell where, how you have to do the iteration. So what you have to put the time indices in the iteration, okay? I will not enter into these details, uh, but that's why it is powerful. Because if you don't put uh, the right time indices, then, and you try to iterate these equations, it's not sure that they converge where they should converge. Okay. So for, for a time in this is story, that you can just look to the, to the review by uh, Lenk and Florent. Uh, so by time in this is... Okay, so, okay. sorry, I, I was... <laughs> sorry. So when you, when you iterate here, for example, you can... Okay, so... You can put here t, man, uh, so t. This will be t plus one. Okay, but then here, in principle, you would like to put t. Instead, it's not t. It's t minus one. How do you see? It's that you see this because it comes from the previous uh, the previous equation. Okay. So here, in principle, it should be t minus one. If I'm not wrong. So there is a way in which you have to put these time indices that comes from our derivation, so the derivation that we did now. Uh, and this was argued by Montanari and then uh, by Lenk and Florent. Uh, and this is really important. So there, there are also mathematical papers by both Thousand. <coughs> in the context <coughs> of the SK model, <coughs> where where they show that putting the right time indices allows you to have convergence of these equations when you are in the replica symmetric phase. Okay. So now the last thing that I want to do is to recover the replica symmetric equation. Okay. So I will do it uh, here. OK, 
Okay, so so the way in which we, we fix the spherical constraint is the following. So we have V. So let me so we have VK that are just let me write this. Way. So it's just a fluctuation of delta xi. That's xk. I think. So V Okay, so this is <coughs> now this thing is equal to one. And therefore, this is one minus one over n. Because this is just a k, right? So this gives you an equation that fixes uh, lambda. Fixes lambda. Okay. Now let me make this function r uh, and f explicit. So now I will assume that I'm in the subphase. So I will say that uh, okay, as usual. And if you do this, then so it's a uh, simple completion. R of omega and B, it's just a uh, Maybe you start to recognize this function. This, this is just the f. So what we call f1 and h of the uh, last lectures. This was the log of gamma. Okay, I will tell you. 1 minus q. So actually, we didn't put the sigma here. We have here, but uh, there is no problem with that. Okay, and why, what is Q? Well, Q is, is just that, right? So this is, uh, this is just Q. Okay, so this is Okay, let me rewrite it here. <coughs> Okay, then this function here, fa, is uh, fa of sigma and t. It's just t over one plus lambda hot sigma. So these are computation by definition. Okay, so so then this equation becomes just sigma and then the AI okay, so this is This is the i one plus lambda sigma, and then we have the other equations. Okay. okay so from this equation, okay. From this equation, so let let's recover the replica symmetric result. So we have 
So if we take this equation, then we have uh, 1 plus lambda at sigma is equal to, okay, because v is 1 minus q. And therefore, from this one, we have ai that is equal to 1 minus q ti over sigma. And now we have that q is 1 over n ai squared, which is 1 minus q squared divided by sigma half squared and the i ti squared. And now ti, what is it? Now since I have to compute the square, I will completely neglect this term that is of order 1 over n, and I will just keep this one. So let me write here. So ti squared. Uh, squared and then we have some of new new i r squared and this is so when I expand this only the term with mu equal to mu will uh, will matter and then at leading order and then this is sigma squared 1 over n, the 1 over n comes from the square of this term, r squared omega mu, v. And this v is 1 minus q, right? Now, so if you consider omega mu, <coughs> Again, if you neglect this term, then this is, on average, is a random variable with zero mean, because the, the average of this term is zero, and variance that is exactly equal to Q. Okay. So when you, okay, let me write here. So omega mu, is zero and so this term here the, the, this one it's just uh, so let me write just that term one over n sum over sum over mu this is just alpha because here I have a sum over mu that gives me m terms, so this alpha, and then I have just a Gaussian integral over a variable, let's call it omega. And then I have r squared, so it's the omega Okay, and then if we plug this into, what did, what did I, yes, this equation, what do we have, what do we get, so, so remember that ti squared is this one, So taking back this equation, this is Q equal to, so you have this sigma squared that simplify with this one. So you have 1 minus Q squared. And then you have this term, alpha.
this is the replica symmetric equation. It's, it's a cumbersome, let's say cumbersome, but it's, it's a less straightforward way to get the replica symmetric equation. I mean, this, is, this has real advantages because it gives you an algorithm, which is really powerful. Okay. okay, so just a few comments. So, the, so this algorithm that we have derived it has uh, a fixed point that is, it, it, it has one fixed point when you are in the, the paramagnetic phase or in the replica symmetric phase. But when you go to the replica symmetry broken phase, it turns out that it has many fixed points. So these equations admit a lot of fixed points. And this is exactly what we discussed with replicas, right? When, when we go in the replica symmetry broken phase, the phase space gets clustered, okay? And so you can imagine that for each cluster, you have a solution of these fixed points. Okay, roughly. Okay. So what we did is that, for example, here we assume that we have just one fixed point in the sense that this is the only variable that you get. But when you are in the replica symmetry program phase, this thing becomes more complicated. I will not enter in how you treat these equations in the replica symmetry program phase. Okay. But so, the, the, the point is that when you are in the replica symmetry phase, the fixed point of this equation is unique, and you can look at the stability of this fixed point when you iterate this equation. Okay. And it turns out that when you cross the instability line where the replica symmetry breaks, this fixed point is no more stable, okay? It becomes unstable. So you can compute the instability line from this equation just by looking at the stability of the fixed point that you have in the replica symmetric phase, okay? And that's actually how, uh, from the tauless anderson palmer equation, we are able to get the, the replica symmetry breaking transition. Okay, so... So, do we have five minutes? Okay, in the last five minutes, okay, just comments. Uh, so there are many things that we have not done, of course. So I, I plan to do the dynamics of the same model, but there is no time. So there is a paper that is very recent, that uh, if you are interested in, you can look at. I will write it uh, here. So it's uh, Agoritsas. We all myself and some point. It's 2017, where we discussed uh, two ways to obtain the, the dynamics of this, this model. So what you do is that you study the Langevin dynamics uh, of this model. So you have uh, so you say that you have that this is the Lagrange multiplier. This is the Hamiltonian of the model. And here you put some uh, white noise term. Okay. So what we need is to study these dynamics, okay, and to show that when you go to equilibrium, for example, and you are in the replica symmetric phase, you get back this equation. So there is a third way to derive this equation that is starting from uh, from this. So you know that this dynamics converges to the Boltzmann distribution, okay. So the long time limit of these dynamics should give you the same results of uh, the replica approach or the top approach. Yes? What do you use the time scale of the dynamics you mean? How much time you need to, to wait before conversion? Sorry? What, what in the equations like this, what can define a kind of time scale that tells you how long you need to wait to iterate in order to know when you come back? Uh, 
I mean, here the time scale is just of order one. What happens is that when you cross the, the I mean, here is if you want it, you, you can put a constant to, to just <coughs> arrange the time scale. Okay, but no, the time sort of here yes, sort of time scale is of the order of one over lambda. Lambda, maybe you yes. Can say. But lambda is fixed self-consistent because then you want that some one over m somewhere i x i squared. This is one. So, so this lambda is the same. Is right? the same. It's a lambda of t. So the should drive it. So this depends on time. This depends on time. Ah, ah because time. you evolve on this, on the always on the constraint. Yes, uh, always on the right. spherical constraint. So when you are in the replica symmetric phase, you have just a unique uh, minimum of the top. Uh, uh, equations and then the dynamics is very fast and you go to the you relax to the so this xi they converge to on a, the average of xi converges to ai and then you will have thermal fluctuations around these values and this this is fast in the sense that it's exponential then when you reach the replica symmetry breaking transition you have dynamics slowing down in the sense that the dynamics the relaxation is more exponential and then in the broken phase, you can show that this dynamics, I mean, uh, it depends on where you are in the broken phase. This dynamics may converge to the, to the Gibbs distribution only on time scales that are very, very large, for example, exponential. OK, so this is something that we did here. Uh, so what I have not done at all, uh, but I have not done on purpose in the sense that there are good reviews uh, on the subjects uh, is so to compute one how to compute the complexity okay so this is something that you can do using the replica approach uh, and it, it was something that was done by Monson. Um, and there are good, there are uh, reviews on this. The one by Castellani and Cavagna. Uh, and the one by Zamponi. So they are online, so you can just look at them. Uh, so the other thing that we have not done is to discuss sparse models. So uh, the perceptron that we have discussed is a fully connected model. But as I've shown you, you can have, for example, programs in computer science where the model is defined on a random graph that is locally tree-like. So this is sparse. It's said to be sparse. And you can adapt these techniques to solve these models. Uh, and for this, you have the book by Mezar and Montanari. Uh, and even in, in this lecture notes, there is, uh, there is uh, a good uh, thing. Uh, and then, of course, I've not done anything uh, on real glasses, on structural glasses. But these techniques can be adapted uh, to, to the structural glass case. OK. OK. Uh, so the last thing is that these things have been uh, done. Uh, some of the results are produced using grant that is from LabEx. And uh, this is acknowledged. And the last thing is that I would like to acknowledge Ricardo and uh, Sylvain for the organization. And uh, it's a Thank you.